Uh, welcome and thank you very much for accepting the invitation to give a, a talk uh, tonight. Uh, I'm very much looking forward uh, to this. And um, let me just briefly remind you that uh, this lecture series is organized by the Society for Intercultural Philosophy uh, together with uh, College of Fellows at Tübingen University. And um, uh, please, if you if you're not familiar with the Society for Intercultural Philosophy so far, have a look at our webpage. Um, uh, we can uh, we can uh, write the um, URL. Yeah, there it is already in the chat. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, you're well welcome to uh, visit uh, um, other lectures of the series. Just let me know, and I'm happy to um, invite you for the further lectures. Um, and also, you're very welcome to uh, become a member of our society. So just have a look at the homepage and maybe you're interested in this. Um, welcome to all of you. Uh, we're going to do this um, uh, in the way that um, Maria is, uh, will present um, her, uh, her talk, uh, her paper. And afterwards, we'll have um, plenty of time for uh, Q and A uh, remarks and uh, and just uh, hopefully a, a, a vivid uh, discussion. Um, for a short short introduction and um, of uh, Maria and uh, introduction to uh, tonight's lecture, um, I hand over to Fernando Wiltz. Um, he's uh, um, he's uh, a research fellow at our center, um, and he uh, is treasurer treasurer of the sorry of the Society for Intercultural Philosophy, and knows Maria uh, quite well. So he's uh, going to take over for the introduction. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Welcome again. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to have Professor Solea as a guest today. Um, she's not just a, an excellent and important scholar, but also amazing person and amazing teacher that I was lucky enough to have at the University of Buenos Aires. Let me just say a few words about her work. Um, she studied philosophy at the University of Buenos Aires and also did some stays abroad at the Humboldt University in Berlin and then the Leibniz University in Hanover. She is a researcher at the National Scientific Research Council in Argentina, that's the national research agency there. Um, she is now a professor also at the University of Buenos Aires. She teaches history of modern philosophy and she also coordinates two different um, research groups one on Spinoza and one on German idealism. Regarding to this, she's also a boarding member of the International Fichte Society and also from the Latin American Fichte Society. Um, with the, they just published uh, uh, a collection of essays on the reception of Fichte in Latin America. And she was also an editor of that book. I think these days the book was just published. Mm, let me mention two more publications that you should keep your radar. One is uh, her study on the reception of Spinoza in Germany from 2011. And the other is uh, a reader on, on the illustration of the Aufklärung where she selected, commented, and translated texts from Lessing, Mendelssohn, Jacobi, Reinhold, and so on. This is just a small part of her work and her publications, but I hope that gives you an idea of her research. Um, yeah, we are very grateful to have you here, Jimena. The floor is yours. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon to all. Thank you, Fernando, for, for this kind introduction. And thank you very much, Dr. Weidmann, for this generous invitation to participate in this lecture series. Uh, it's very nice to see so many familiar faces and names, and also exciting to get to know new people and to 
try these ideas in, in a new audience. So I, I will welcome any comment or, or question or just uh, thoughts on, on what I am about to present. So I will talk about the early reception of uh, Fichte in, in Latin America. Johann Gottlieb Fichte, who you probably know, he is the founding figure of this philosophical movement called German idealism and author of a system, a philosophical system he named Wissenschaftslehre or science of knowledge. For this purpose, I will refer mainly to Juan Bautista Alberdi, who most of you I'm sure do not know. Alberdi is one of the most important Argentine thinkers of the 19th century, and as far as I know, the first in the region to mention Fichte's name in a book published in 1837, a book which condenses the program of the so-called romantic generation of our country, of Argentina. What I am going to share with you are the first results of a research which has quite recently begun and which is to a great extent exploratory, both regarding the subject, because there are no academic works dealing with this question, and also regarding to methodology, how to study the reception of an author, a doctrine, an idea in others when the distance both geographical, linguistical, and cultural is so big. So before I begin, I would like to say something about how this research came about. For some years now, in Latin America, Fichte's philosophy has been attracting scholars with increasing intensity. The number of academic publications, research projects, and seminars on Fichte and philosophy and in our soil in our universities have been more and more significant. A Latin American Association of Fichte Studies has been created more than a decade ago where I participate very actively. And its international conferences have become more and more inviting and more and more fruitful. In the international field, of the Fichte studies, the participation and initiatives of local researchers have also gained increasing weight and have widely been recognized. So this experience has, has led us to ask ourselves why. Why Fichte, a German thinker of the late 18th and early 19th century so, is so significant to us, inhabitants of another land, another time, speakers of other languages. This question have, has become more and more intense to the point of becoming a question that determines our point of view and our readings that guide the way we practice our profession. We want to read Fichte, write about his philosophy. We want to translate his writings and teach his ideas without losing sight of our own circumstances without denying our condition of Latin Americans, without abstracting ourselves from our context. And although it is clear that this would be impossible, we cannot simply get rid of our identity, participation in academic circles and professionalized practice of philosophy often seem to demand it. So these concerns and our desire to explore the link between Fichte's philosophy and our situated philosophical activity, our cultural traditions, our own ideas and everyday practices, led us to propose this theme, Fichte in the Americas, as the theme of our sixth international conference in the Latin American Society of Fichte Studies. So this conference was held in April last year. It was organized by our research group on idealism of the University of Buenos Aires. And it was attended by a large number of participants. As a result, we were able to reconstruct 
for the first time the history of the reception of Fichte's thought in our territory. So we discovered as a collective result that it is a history made up of echoes, appropriations, affinities, which bear witness both to the permeability and the strength of Latin American thought. And we discovered that our interest in Fichte, our affinity with his ideas is not something completely new, something that came out of nowhere, but it has a history. There is a tradition of Fichte studies in Latin America and what at, what at first sight seemed to be an empty and sterile territory was in truth the result of a process of invisibilization. A few weeks ago, like Fernando said, a book in Spanish and Portuguese came off the presses, bringing together many texts, many of, of the articles presented and discussed at that meeting. And now a publication in English is also in preparation. So what I am about to share with you is a brief extract from my contribution to this volume. So I, I will just show the book. This is the Spanish and Portuguese version, and we will soon have the English version. Um, well, so now I will share my screen, if that's okay, and I will read the, the short presentation that I prepared for today. So that's, I think you can all see. Yeah? Okay. So the early reception of Fichte in Latin America, Juan Bautista Alvarez. Fichte's reception in Argentina was inaugurated by Juan Bautista Alberdi in his preliminary fragment to the study of law, published in 1837. It is not surprising to find Alberti one of the most outstanding Argentine thinkers and one of the main local receptors of the European philosophy of his time at the beginning of this story. Alberti was a lawyer, a diplomat, a politician, a journalist, a writer, and a philosopher. He was born in Tucumán on August 29, 1810, a few months after the May Revolution, which established the first local government, the Primera Junta. He started school in his native province and at the age of 11, he obtained a scholarship to continue his studies at the renowned College of Moral Sciences in Buenos Aires, where a large part of the Argentine intellectual elite of the time was formed. In 1832, he began to study law at the University of Buenos Aires and concluded his studies at the University of Córdoba where he received his degree. Back in Buenos Aires in 1837, he participated in the inauguration of the Literary Salon founded by the writer Marco Sartre and frequented by younger members of the literary elite, the so-called Romantic generation, eager to actively participate in the cultural life of the country and the first intellectual movement that set itself the historical task of building a national identity and establishing the foundation of a true republic. The agenda of this intellectual movement is condensed in the speech delivered by Alberdi on the occasion of the inauguration of this literary salon. Alberti adopts a philosophy of history according to which there is a transcendent legality that directs all human events and makes humanity advance towards its indefinite perfection. All historical events contribute to this progressive movement, including the emancipatory victories of South America. All peoples necessarily develop, but each one develops in its own ways, he asserts. Against the concept of history as a civilization process, that advances in a linear and homogeneous way, Alberti adopts this romantic philosophy of history, which considers that each people participate in its own way in this progressive movement, each one fulfilling its specific role in the improvement of the human race, 
since each one is worth as much as the others. Each people, therefore, has as much uh, has and must have its own civilization, which is combined with the universal law of human development. It is then a matter of finding the specificity, specificity of the Argentine people, the national way of being, to advance, to progress, to perfect itself, and therefore fulfill its specific role in the progressive development of the human spirit. On the basis of this philosophy of history, Alberti considers that Argentine people still uneducated and lacking in culture will be transformed over time into a subject capable of displaying the goods and values of civilization. To achieve this, it is necessary to abandon the colonial tradition, the colonial condition, um, abandon the cultural inherited by Spain and become an authentic nation. This task, with the revolutionaries of May had neglected, is the mission that Alberti and the young romantics claim as their own. Alberti argues that although the development of the Argentine people began with the May revolution, it was a failed beginning because they acted without having deliberated, without being aware of what they were doing. It is time he proposes to question philosophy about the path that the Argentine nation is designed to follow in order to reach the common goal of humanity. This program is further developed in the pre preliminary fragment of the study of the law of the same year. This is the work that it includes the mention of Fichte in an extensive note at the end of the book in which Alberti states his position with respect to the philosophical trends of the time. In this context, he summarizes the intellectual itinerary of Victor Cousin, this French philosopher whose works had an immense impact on the local intellectual environment at that time. According to Alberti, Cousin had begun by commenting on the Scottish school, then moved on to Germany and became a Kantian, and later embracing the spirit of the age and becoming an eclectic. In connection with this, Alberti states, fortunately for Cousin, the systematic idealism of Kant and Fichte had been succeeded by the eclectic realism of Schelling and Hegel, who also gave birth to the democratic society. A few years later, Alberti mentions Fichte again in another writing, an article published in 1842 in the Uruguayan newspaper El Nacional, entitled Ideas to Preside Over the Preparation of the Course of Contemporary Philosophy in the College of Humanities. For 3,000 years, says Alberti, philosophy has tried to solve diverse questions related to human spirit, and each country, each time, and each school have given di different answers. Therefore, he argues, there is no one philosophy in the 19th century, but many partial attempts at, def at a definitive philosophy. And he concludes, the philosophy of this century can be conceived as a collection of special systems more or less contradictory to each other. What is, what is it to know a philosophy of this century, to know Fichte, Hegel, Stuart, Kant, Cousin, Schufra, Leroux, and so on. There are philosophers, but not philosophy. Systems, not science. Alberti places Fichte at the top of a list in which the German thinker would not have wanted to find himself. He presents himself as the author of a system that fails to rise to the level of a true science. Although Fichte would have been indignant at this criticism, there is no doubt that he would agree with its spirit. One must not confuse particular systems with authentic philosophical science. With these two references, Alberti initiated the reception of Fichte in our territory. Certainly, these passages do not do not allow us to suppose that, Fichte, that Alberti had read Fichte, nor do the references provide sufficient conceptual elements to, 
to reconstruct an appropriation, however indirect, of Fichte's ideas. Nothing in Alberti's writings allows us to suspect that he had news of the Wissenschaftslehre. Nevertheless, he mentions Fichte's name and includes him in the symbolic universe of his own philosophical references. This, present, this presence of Fichte in the texts of the young Alberti allows us to recreate a connection between them and invites us to think about the possibility of their intellectual paths coming closer, crossing, and even overlapping. Indeed, despite the geographical distance, despite the difference in language and the diversity of the particular context, cultural context, in which each of them developed their thinking, it is possible to discover a deep affinity between the ideas of Fichte and the young Albert. My intention is not to compare these ideas, but to seek the crossroads between these two thinkers, revealing the complexity of their thoughts. My conviction is that putting Fichte in dialogue with Alberti, reading Alberti from Fichte and looking for their affinities, allows us to shed new light on their positions and to better understand them in their own specificity. I would like to draw your attention to what I find as a clear intersection between our two philosophers. Both Fichte and the young Alberti make freedom the central object of their philosophical considerations and the main goal of their philosophical activity. The Wissenschaftslehre, writes Fichte in a famous passage from his correspondence, is the first system of freedom. Indeed, freedom is the foundation of his idealist philosophy and his entire work can be read as an exhortation to recognize ourselves as free beings, to abandon the fatalism inherent in the dogmatic vision of the world and to exercise our freedom in all spheres of our lives. For the young Alberti, freedom is the fundamental principle of sociability, the foundation of equality among men and the very life of the people. Freedom is never absolutely lacking to a people, and if it were absolutely lacking, it would perish because freedom is life, he writes in his preliminary fragment to the study of law. Like Fichte, Alberti considers that freedom is the fruit of work and effort. It is something that is achieved. To be free, he argues, one must, must be worthy of freedom. Freedom does not spring from a single blow. It is the slow birth of civilization, he claims. As already mentioned, Alberti subscribes to a philosophy of history based on progress and improvement and points out that there is an indestructible parallelism between civilization and freedom. The affinity with Fichte is revealed at this point with an intensity that transcends the mere letter and reaches the spirit of his doctrine. According to Alberti, a people is civilized only when, when it is self-sufficient when it possesses the theory and formula of its life, the law of its development. That is, when it, when it achieves full autonomy, the self-positing that on the transcendental Fichtean plane crowns the system. A free will is not enough. It also requires intelligence, reflection, and an awareness of the law of its specific development. That is why for the young Alberti, philosophy is responsible for the realization of authentic emancipation. Political autonomy alone is not enough. To be truly free requires cultural autonomy, which implies a reflexive elevation to an awareness of one's own specificity, of one's own identity. Like Fichte, Alberti conceives the emancipatory task of philosophy as the completion of a revolutionary process that is still incomplete. 
both Fichte and Alberti think of philosophy in analogy with the event of the revolution. The paths at this juncture appear to be advancing in a parallel way. In the same letter of 1795, where he, Fichte, presents his Wissenschaftslehre as the first system of freedom, Fichte states that the French Revolution succeeded in liberating human beings from the oppressive institutions of monarchical despotism. However, the emancipatory process is not yet complete. It is necessary to carry out a revolution at the theoretical level, a philosophical revolution that frees men from dogmatism as well as from the fatalism and the materialism to which it leads. Dogmatism, the theoretical position that places the foundation of reality in a transcendent God, is the true root of political oppression and the source of the spiritual slavery in which, according to Fichte, the majority of his contemporaries find themselves. It is not enough to cut off the political chains of slavery. It is necessary to get rid of the invisible chains of dogmatic thought in all its variations. This is the task of idealism. Alberti, for his part, presents his philosophical project in connection with the unfinished May Revolution, which in 1810 had initiated the process of American independence, Latin American independence. We have already mentioned that in his speech at the inauguration of the Literary Salon, Alberti presents his critical interpretation of the May Revolution, which he considers to be the South American echo of the French Revolution. The process of national independence had begun with the, that fundamental historical event, but it had begun wrongly. Alberti says there, the general movement of the world had forced the Argentines to begin the revolution where it should end, that is, in action. While France had started by thinking in order to conclude by deeds, the revolutionaries of May had taken the opposite path. In the same vein, he states in the preliminary fragment to the study of law, our fathers gave us material independence. It is up to us to conquer our own form of civilization, the conquest of the American genius. We were tied to Europe by two chains, a material chain that was broken, an intellectual chain that is still alive. Our fathers broke the one by the sword, we will break the other by thought. This new conquest shall consummate our emancipation. The reign of action is past, we enter the reign of thought. We will have heroes, but they will come from the bosom of philosophy. The May Revolution achieved what Alberti calls material independence, won through the force of the sword. Authentic freedom remains to be conquered. Authentic freedom must be produced by ideas, by thoughts. It is the slow birth of civilization. That is why the heroes of this new era will come from the ranks of philosophy, not from armies. Humanity is progressing towards its perfection, towards freedom and equality. But the surest way to drive away this promising future, Alberti warns, is to hasten its arrival with imprudence. This is what the revolutionaries of May did, the promoters of independence who, with their haste, added to the obstacles and set back the cause instead of pushing it forward. According to Alberti, all the evils that South America was going through, its internal wars, the triumph of authoritarianism, the social instability bordering on anarchy, can be explained by the fact that the natural order of the events had been violated. The idea of political freedom has not been understood. The thought about freedom are missing. Philosophy as a result, has the mission to take the lead in the development of the country. Fichte had presented his Wissenschaftslehre as a revolution in theory, 
a revolution in ideas, which frees human beings from the spiritual chains that bring them and prevent them from recognizing themselves as free and from exercising their freedom. Alberti also considers that philosophy is called to produce the spiritual revolution that completes the unfinished material revolution, manages to break the ideological chains that still subjugate the Argentine people, making them mimic foreign customs and live according to strange laws. The affinity is clear. Both thinkers ascribe to philosophy an emancipatory task, and they do not end here. I will not develop this, but it is worth mentioning that both consider that in order to carry out this task, philosophy must be a national philosophy that springs from self-consciousness of the people. And both recognize the central role of the scholars in the promotion of the progressive advance of the human race towards perfection and freedom. These affinities allow us to discover the Fichtian spirit in Alberti's letter and to think of a cross of crossroads between their intellectual paths. And they also reveal the existence of a bridge between Fichte's Germany and the Argentina of the early 19th century, which immersed in the process of independence seeks in its own philosophy, the formula to achieve a national organization. This bridge built by Alberdi in 1837 brings Fichte to our soil and opens the possibility of finding the echoes and resonances of his ideas in our na native ideas. For us, current Latin American readers of Fichte who study, comment on, and translate his works, who think with his Wissenschaftslehre, the discovery of this bridge confronts us with the challenge of updating the spirit of Alberdi and engaging in an authentic philosophical dialogue with a foreign tradition without renoun renouncing the ne necessary construction of a thought that we can call our own. The development of a national philosophy was for Fichte and Alberdi, as it is for us, a way of positioning oneself before the world, a way of transforming reality, a path towards the conquest of authentic freedom. Far from the idea of a philosophy abstracted from its environment, both <laughs> provide us with the example of a philosopher committed to their time and attentive to the needs of their people. It is in this sense that Fichte and also Alberti challenge us and inspire us with the enthusiasm to care for the philosophical fire and spread it in the Americas. Thank you very much.